Hey there, peeps. Let's take a look at centripetal force in terms of the physical force that causes it. Because remember, centripetal force is a net force. Don't forget it, a net force. Therefore, let's take a look at the four forces that we discussed before. Uh, those aren't the only ones. We didn't discuss the electric force, the magnetic force. There are others that create centripetal force. But the four that we will study are tension, static friction, normal force, and universal gravitation. All right, how about this? The simplest one actually is tension. If you have tension that's causing uniform circular motion, then that equals m v tangent squared over the radius. This is the cause of that circular motion, and this is the effect. Oftentimes, the tension is just how much something is pulling, and we just have to kind of figure it out in terms of maybe some other variables, or we're told that it's pulled with like 50 newtons or something like that. Whereas if we have static friction, for example, we d discussed the situation where tires um, of the vehicle, so a car or a bicycle or whatever, um, anytime you want to turn, you've got to rely on that frictional force to keep you in that turn. Okay. So what we have here is that the force of friction static is creating the centripetal force. Okay, so this is an expression for um, force of friction static. And we know that force of friction static is mu static times force normal. All right, so let's just kind of take a simple situation here and say that the surface um, is responding only to the weight of the object on it. So there are no other crazy forces that are lifting it somehow or um, pulling up or down to complicate the situation. It's just the weight of the object on the surface, and we know that the surface will push back with the same amount of force. So mass times gravity on the surface and the normal force pushing up. So what we have over here is that the force normal in this situation is mass times gravity. What I can't stand is that you guys will see this sometimes and say, it's always mass times gravity. No, 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 no. Never, never, never say that. Okay. This is a specific situation, and physics is all about analyzing specific situations. So here we go. Um, so force of friction static is mass times gravity, the force normal part, times mu static. So it's mu times mg equals the expression that we know for uniform circular motion. m times v tangent squared over r. Notice this. <laughs> mass is canceled. Doesn't matter what the mass is of the object that's making the turn. Doesn't matter if it's a bicycle or a tractor trailer. The mass doesn't matter in terms of making it around the corner. It's all about the performance of the tires relative to the um, asphalt surface in this case if we're talking about vehicles okay um, so that's really interesting it's only dependent on mu and g well okay so the higher the mu the better turning ability you have and g which is well um, you know it's pretty constant for the earth but if you go to a different planet you'd have different abilities to turn interesting right so if you're designing a car for the moon well you're not gonna be able to turn as tight okay let's take a look at the maximum velocity that you can have. I saw this for V tangent. It's the square root of mu static times the acceleration of gravity times the radius. So that's the max speed around the circle without it slipping. And so, yeah, the higher the mu, the higher the velocity. The higher the gravity is, the higher the velocity can be, and the higher the radius. So if you have a big turn versus a tiny turn uh, with a small radius, you can go faster without slipping. So that's what this says. All right, well, let's take a look at the normal force. Now what we're going to say is that, hey, again, to remind you, it is the Newton's third law res uh, response from the surface may depend on other forces or orientation of the system. We did not take that into account here. Just made it really simple. Um, so sometimes that means that you'll have to analyze it. So if it's uh, like a roller coaster going around a bank or a berm or something like that, then you got to figure out what the normal force is that's pushing that uh, the cars um, back onto the track or keeping them in the track. Okay, so the cause is force normal, but we have to look at maybe through a free body diagram all the other forces that are involved to figure out what the normal force is. And once we do that, then we set it equal to mv tangent squared over r. Okay, so this is very generic over here, but it's, it really depends on the situation. So we would need to look at that depending on how that was set up. Um, universal gravitation, very interesting one, allows us to study things like the motion of the planets around the sun or the moon around the Earth or satellites around the Earth, 
uh, to establish something called geosynchronous orbit, which means that if you were to look up in the sky, you would see that object following you, but it's actually moving around at the same um, angular velocity, it has the same period around that the Earth does in a day, which is well, 24 hours or however many seconds that is. So here we go. We got universal gravitation, G. I call this M orbit, the mass of the thing that's doing the orbiting, like the satellite, for example, or the moon. M large would be the Earth, maybe. Okay, so we'll call that the Earth um, over the radius squared. So it's the radius of the uh, Earth squared plus whatever altitude from there. And um, notice that on this side, we've got M V tangent squared over R. This is the mass of the object doing the orbiting. The masses cancel out. So what do we have here? Well, we can calculate a couple of things. We can figure out V tangential. What is the orbital speed? How fast does it have to go? And this tells us something, tells us like rocket scientists, for example, how fast does the rocket have to go in order for an object to be put in orbit or maybe escape orbit, something like that. So we can extend this to something called escape velocity. But in order to orbit at a particular radius, then we calculate it like this, the square root of g times the mass of, in this case, the Earth, m large, over the radius. Well, what if we wanted to figure out what's the orbital time? Like, how long is it going to take for that object to orbit Earth at its given altitude? All right? So I've got the same exact equation over here, but I've only solved it for t instead of v tangent. So t equals the square root of 4 pi squared r cubed. So if you do the math, you figure out that there's actually an r cubed in there, which is kind of interesting, divided by uh, g times m large to the mass of the Earth. That's the orbital time for one revolution around whatever it might be, in this case, the Earth. Okay, so we put a satellite in, uh, International Space Station, how many times is it going to rotate around the Earth in a given day? That would be a cool question to ask, something like that. How many times could you wave at the astronauts at the ISS if um, it were to actually um, follow something like the equator, if you're always at the equator? All right, so that's what it is. That's uniform circular motion. These are the four physical forces and the things that we can do to evaluate them. Um, some of them we can do pretty readily without knowing anything more about the situation, like the static friction and universal gravitation. Others, we would need to do some more analysis to really figure out the exact specific situation, like normal force and tension. Okay, that's what it is. Morad, out.